Ladies and gentlemen, Okay, we are. Do we have Abdurrahman Muhammad with us? Do we have Abdurrahman Muhammad with us? Do we? Have, okay, I'm waiting for Abdurrahman Muhammad to join. Waiting for Abdurrahman Muhammad to join. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry about the technical difficulties. But if you will be patient and join us, I can assure you that you are going to hear a most excellent broadcast and conversation between myself and brother Abdurrahman Muhammad. Other than that, I hope everyone's having a beautiful day. Of course, the the temperatures are warm throughout much of these United States of America right now. And You got to enjoy. So here we're going to add up the rough mind right now from Washington, D.C., Howard University, the Howard Bison represent. I'm still mad to cut the wrestling team, but of course, a great uh, history uh, in America is, is Howard with. Uh, Am I on now? There it is. You're on here. All right. You on the air. Brother right, Abdurrahman right, right, Muhammad. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What's up, Ak? Right? <laughs> hey, what is a will does a way. Respect, I hear you. Respect to the sister that made this happen. You know, she gets her credit, you know, for making this happen. So let, let's get right to it, if we will. Uh, Brother Abdurrahman Muhammad is a uh, one of the foremost experts on the life of Malcolm X. He's a Malcolm X researcher, a uh, historian of the life of Malcolm. And they have a Malcolm X tour coming up in May. Tell us a little bit about that tour, Abdurrahman. I'm going to put some headsets in, all right? Yeah, put some headsets in. I, we want to hear about this tour. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be there or you're going to be square? Yeah, we are, you're, going to, you're going to have to yeah, be on this tour. Can you hear me now, brother? I can hear you. I can hear you, brother. I can hear you. Okay, good. You let's go. You. Let's go at this thing. I, all right, brother, tell us about this tour. I apologize to your right? audience. Brother, we're going to New York. We're going to revisit the, the steps in the life of Brother El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. Um, we're going to, first of all, talk about his history in Washington, D.C. Not many people know that uh, he was the minister here uh, for a short time during 1963. And uh, he also helped to uh, recruit the minister, uh, the longtime minister of, of Washington, uh, Minister Lonnie X. Cross, uh, one of the first college graduates to join he, the Nation of Islam. And he, he saw mathematics. He met Martin Luther King in D.C. and there was eyewitnesses that said that he was milling in the crowd to march on Washington. Is this correct? That's correct. There you go. And so we're going to discuss all of that. You know, the, the, the one time that he met Dr. King on Capitol Hill when they were debating uh, the Civil Rights Bill in Congress, and um, they were actually prompted, you know, uh, kind of tricked, in, in a sense, uh, into bumping into one another to get that photo op. But, uh, yeah, the, the one and only time where uh, Malcolm met Dr. King face-to-face, -face, uh, he did go to Selma uh, during the, you know, the last weeks of his life, um, but unfortunately, Dr. King was in prison at that time, and he told... Dr. Uh, Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's wife, whatever he could do to assist in the struggle, all they had to do was pick up the phone and call him. So, yeah, so we're going to leave Washington, D.C. Uh, we're going to journey to New York, uh, his spiritual home, 
um, Malcolm loved New York, and uh, he loved his mosque, Muhammad's Mosque Number no. Seven, at in that Harlem. time. To, in Harlem, yes, sir, 116th Street. Uh, you know, today it's called Masjid Malcolm Shabazz. After him, uh, his, his now his namesake. And uh, by the way, a lot of people don't know that that very corner is where Marcus Garvey. Uh, excuse me, I'm, 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 let me backtrack. Marcus Garvey is the um, the Schomburg, but that very corner there was uh, where you know all the storefront uh, orators in Harlem during the day, the socialists, the communists, the anarchists, all these different groups would get on the ladder and make their case. And, uh, you know, Mal uh, New York was very difficult for Malcolm because he had a lot of uh, different competing ideologies and different worldviews that were, uh, you know, trying to get the air of the masses. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bed of roses at first when he first got there. But, yes, we're going to visit his mosque. We're going to visit the Autobahn Ballroom or what is uh, left of it because um, today it's known as the Malcolm X, Dr. Betty Shabazz, Memorial and Educational Center. Uh, it's really just a, a remnant of what it once was. It's the, the uh, Columbia University uh, preserved that space or that area of the ballroom where Brother Malcolm was uh, brutally cut down on February 21st, 1965. But we're going to visit that site, which is a, uh, something of a museum and a memorial. There's uh, video presentations and uh, they also have symposiums there and functions and uh, those types of things. But it's an educational facility, but we are going to visit the very spot where uh, Brother Malcolm uh, lost his life in the cause of freedom and justice and equality. We'll be going out to East, East Elmhurst, Queens? to the, Absolutely. Um... We're going to visit both of his houses. A lot of folks don't know that before he moved into the house uh, that was firebombed, he lived in another house with John Ali, who would later go on to become the national secretary, a couple of blocks away. So we're going to visit both of those homes. I just learned Maybe. something new. I didn't even know John Ali had lived in New York. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was, John Ali was the secretary of Muhammad's Mosque Number no. 7 under Malcolm. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a close working relationship for a long time. In fact, they lived together. You know, they lived mm -hmm. together for a long time. And then it's only when uh, Malcolm sends him to Chicago to become the national secretary of the Nation of Islam that John Ali is going to become one of, one of his uh, most virulent enemies and uh, nemesis, arch nemesis in the Nation of Islam and will ultimately you know, be part of the conspiracy to cut down his life, to kill him, to assassinate him. John Ali is going to come to New York just days before the assassination of Malcolm X, and he's going to fly to Chicago, you know, in the immediate aftermath of his assassination. He's about 89 years old, and he's still alive today, and he lives in Chicago. He and, disappeared uh, for 40 years after 75. He just had, he had a public sighting in 2015 to save his day, but a lot of people thought he was dead, right? Uh, no, people didn't believe he was dead. I mean, he just went uh, he just went very low key, you know. He knows he's an infamous individual. Uh, he knows he's been uh, accused. Well, let's get back to that later because we're going to talk. I got mm -hmm. a segment. We're going to talk about the conspiracies. Mm -hmm. Let me try to build this up systematically. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the first question we want to address in this video is why Malcolm? And I'm going to lead and then you give your why Malcolm. Why 53 years after the assassination of Malcolm? A man that would have been in his 90s today. A man that was in prison, was a street hustler, was a, a kid struggling to get by, is globally famous, internationally famous, and inspirational to so many. Um, for me, when I read Mac, Ma Manny Marable's Malcolm X, A Life and Re Reinvention, the title said it all for me. When I first read the autobiography of Malcolm, Malcolm became a hero to me. The heroic story, the struggle, the hajj, etc. Yes. When, when we get a little more historical information, we learned that some of that 
information was a little bit embellished and some was omitted, but the general story remains correct for the most part. Right. Um, like all of us, if we write our own biography, we're going to make ourselves look a little bit better at times. Right, it's uh, a memoir. It's a memoir. Mm -hmm. But for me, the heroic part of Malcolm has always been the reinvention. They're always trying to get to that next level of truth. Always trying to strive to be on the next level. And to me, it's, 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 it's a credit that you can discard previous positions. You can discard previous allegiances in the pursuit of justice. So to me, that's why 53 years after the death of Malcolm, the murder of Malcolm, the assassination of Malcolm, that today he remains an inspirational figure. And probably, if you can count on one hand, one of the most influential people in the history of my life, including family members, and I never met the man. He died... 20 years before uh, I was even born. So for you, why Malcolm? Why this journey to Malcolm in your life? Well, uh, unlike you, I was alive uh, when Malcolm was alive. I was a, you know, I was a baby. Um, but, you know, I first heard Malcolm X uh, as a high school student um, right in the immediate aftermath of a um, police incident uh, that so many black folks uh, have uh, had to under, you know, endure. Uh, it was just, you know, just a brutal um, beat down by the police, you know, in Providence, Rhode Island. And so, um, you know, that changed me and uh, it, it gave me what I would call, you know, some kind of racial consciousness, you know, uh, what it is to be, you know, a black person in America. Every, anyone would tell you, you know, before that time, I was just like the sweetest kid in the world. You know, I, I had friends of all different races and backgrounds. And, um, you know, that police incident made my ears attuned to a voice like Malcolm's. And so I first heard that voice in a, in a bathroom, in a boys, uh, boys room in high school. A friend of mine was, was blasting them on a, uh, like a boom box, you know, and it was like, surreptitious it was something you know uh on the low you know man come on check this out man you know and it may have been message to the grassroots you know it may have been the ballad of the bullet i don't know what it was you know what i mean i had just heard his voice but i knew that this was a bad brother man you know what mm -hmm. i mean i mean and it, and it spoke to my anger because i was very angry at the time because of what had happened to me you know and uh you know, I think I, I realized at that moment, you know, that I was never going to be a Christian again. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I mean, everything that we had been taught in the church about turn the other cheek and, to, you know, be patient and to wait on Jesus to come back and this and that and the third. Uh, you know, I, I was never going to go back to that, you know. And it's really debatable how much I ever really believed in it in the first place. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 but, and we're just going to point out that Malcolm led me to Islam. Malcolm led you to Islam, and I've met hundreds of people that have told me Malcolm led them to Islam. People my age, people your age, people younger. You know, this is. Uh, but continue. But he had an influence, you know, on millions and millions and millions of people the world over. You know, uh, he was made a he was put on a stamp in uh, in Iran. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? When he went to uh, Nigeria. The Muslim, you know, students of Nigeria gave him the name Omawale, you know, the son has returned, you know, so he influenced uh, freedom fighters and, and people who wanted to make a change in this world for the better. He influenced a whole generation uh, of, of young people and now not so young people, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, my age and older um, to stand up to oppression, you know, stand up to the wrongs that have been inflicted on us. Uh, Malcolm said the things that most black people just were afraid to say, wanted to say, but um, were afraid to say. And so uh, for that, for that alone, you know, and, you know, as we discussed in earlier, you know, in Manning Marable's book, Malcolm is not without criticism. He, he's not without shortcomings. He's not without flaws as all human beings are, but for, you know, for standing up just for that, for the, for the courage 
that he uh, instilled in us to stand up and we don't have to take this anymore and to look, you know, to look white people in the face and say, no, you know, the way you, you're treating us is, is that of a devil. You know, mm. that was, I mean, frightful in this, and in this era. And the thing about Mo, and it, right, we got to think about that era. Because in today, it's easy for to go and pop off on Twitter, pop off on social media, this, that. But we're talking about the 1950s. 1950s America, segregated America. You know, where lynchings uh, were occurring on a regular basis, that Malcolm was speaking with this spirit in the 50s, in the 60s. And just think how amazing that people who don't have that context in history can't realize it. But, uh, one of the other impressive things about Malcolm is people that don't like each other love Malcolm. You know what I'm saying? They love Malcolm. If you look at the liberals, they love Malcolm. The conservatives love Malcolm. The Black Lives Matter love uh, Malcolm, and the revolutionary nationalists love Malcolm, and they hate each other, right? The uh, 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 the Sunnis and the Shia, they both love Malcolm. Uh, uh, it's rare to meet someone that does not love Malcolm. That's kind of the universality of the love that people have for Malcolm. I mean, can you think of any other figure like that? I mean, outside of, you know, some biblical figure, you know, any modern figure like that other than Malcolm? Uh, you know, not off the top of my head. Not off the top of my head. Uh, I mean, one could argue that Dr. King is revered. Dr. That King, way. yeah, I was you thinking know? about that. Dr. Well, I mean, King, yeah. You know, Dr. King is, uh, uh, you know, perhaps revered even more than Malcolm. You know, in certain circles. You know, I remember when I lived in the South, in North Carolina, at the time that Spike Lee's movie on Malcolm X came out. You know, and I would ask people. Uh, you're going to go see uh, this new movie by Spike. I mean, it's going to be hot. Brother Malcolm X, you know. And some of those, you know, this was the early 90s, obviously. And some of those folks, even back then, they were like, well, you know, Dr. King is my man. Dr. King is my man. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know. Uh, well, here's the so, thing. I, <laughs> is, uh, uh, I read the autobiography. I was in high school. And by the time the movie came out, I was at Union Station in downtown St. Louis movie theater, which is now closed, handing out dowel flyers outside the entrance to the, the film. And one, side note, one of the brothers I was handing out the dowel flyers with, I would find out years later, had a family member uh, killed in the violence surrounding the death of Malcolm in uh, 1965. That's full circle, you know, uh, very interesting. Now let's get into phase two, bi uh, the bi uh, the autobiography verse. Yeah, I think that's what Manny everybody kind of wants to hear about. Yeah, this this, this <laughs> yeah. you know this this book. So let's get into it. All right, let's get what into it. What would you like it. to know? Mm -hmm. All right, so to you, what for someone that ain't never read either or just read the autobiography in high school and hasn't read it since, what are the main differences? in the two? Well, I mean, the autobiography of Malcolm X, it's, it's a classic of American literature, okay? It's re required reading in high school, in, in almost all black studies programs. It's, you know, uh, again, it's required reading. Uh, it brings in about a million and a half dollars for the Shabazz family every year. Uh, that and their official website for, you know, uh, licensing the photographs and uh, other, you know, insignia of Malcolm X. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a classic book. You know, you, you, um, if you want to be considered a black intellectual and uh, a, a, um, a scholar of the black intellectual tradition, okay, you have to read that book. Okay, it is a powerful narrative um, that uh, speaks, that has spoken to and continues to speak to uh, millions and millions of people around the world, okay? Uh, brilliantly uh, written, obviously, uh, uh, incredibly uh, powerful, but it must be remembered, uh, Omar, that the autobiography is what you would call a memoir, okay? And memoirs are um, our own... A conception of ourselves, all right, the way that we reconstruct our life, you know, before the world, all right, it's not an objective history, okay, 
It's, you know, it's, um, it's subjective. All right. It's very subjective. And it's, that's what memoirs are. All right. Um, and that would be the case if, you know, we were to write our own memoir. It would damn sure be the case if I was writing mine, because I got a lot of stuff I'm not putting yeah. in my memoir. Yeah, we've got mm-hmm. things that you're, uh, you know, that don't uh, reflect too kindly on your character. You know what I mean? And we've all done things that we wish we could take back. And so uh, yeah. everyone comes out to be a hero in their own story. All right? right. But you couple that with the fact that the autobiography was a, uh, a, you know, a partnership between and Alex and Malcolm X and Alex Haley. You know, to give you an interesting story, uh, about 10 years ago, I was going through the papers of Ken McCormick. Ken McCormick was the editor at Doubleday Press at the time that the autobiography was written. And, um, you know, I was trying to find a reference to something else, and I actually was going through in that file the legal vetting for the autobiography of Malcolm X. I mean, I was actually handling the, you know, the type manuscript that uh, Alex Haley had turned into the lawyers to make sure that Doubleday couldn't be sued. For example, um, uh, Malcolm might say, well, you know, Shorty uh, liked white women. Okay, this could be libelous. We could, there'd be, you know, a pencil line Mm. through there. You know, we could Mm. be sued for that. Uh, Malcolm says in Small's Paradise, there was a lot of criminal activity. Okay, we could be liable for that. Okay, so the lawyers have to vet the book, all right? Uh, many of the many of the names of the characters in Malcolm's life were changed, okay, um, to uh, you know, keep them from being exposed to uh, libelous lawsuits and this kind of thing. So I'm going through this file of Ken McCormick, all these you know these Manila envelopes at the rare documents division at the Library of Congress, and Omar, I tell you, it fell into my hands. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't looking for it i didn't even know it was there it was folded it was about three three pages it was folded like you put it in an envelope but it was kind of like uh you know crookedly folded and so i was like what is this you know i unfolded it umar it was the original contract for the autobiography of malcolm x (laughs) signed malcolm x and alex haley and he signed it Malcolm X, not Malcolm X Little. He signed it mm-hmm. Malcolm X, and they uh, they got a twenty thousand dollar advance on mm-hmm. that book. So, uh, but it's uh, getting back to your question. It's a memoir. It's not an objective history. An objective history, okay, it goes over all of the facts related to your life, all right. of the so, evidence related to your life. Yes. So, for the examples of this, you know, uh, Malcolm wants to point the vision of how Elijah Muhammad saved him from the streets. Uh, so he kind of embellishes his criminal history a little bit. He was a petty well, criminal. You know. that's, what the, yeah. that's what the book was supposed to be. In order for Malcolm yeah. to agree to do the book, okay, right. he wanted the book to be a testimony to the power of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. All right? right. So he wanted this to be like so, something of a, of a redemption story, you know, um, um, you know a story of, of a total transformation of one's life under the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. All right. So you're correct. He exaggerated certain aspects of, you know, his criminal life. He especially exaggerated his illiteracy. You know, he would say, I was the most ignorant. I was the most unlettered. I was, you know, that is really just, just not true. Okay. Uh, Malcolm's mother made sure that they read newspapers. They, she was uh, like something of an editor in the Gavi newspaper. So they would read the Negro world. They read newspapers. And even in the autobiography itself, Malcolm kind of gives it away that he's exaggerating his, you know, depravity and uh, savagery because he says that, uh, you know, when he was working at the soda shop, when he sees uh, the young lady, uh, I believe Laura, uh, his girlfriend, reading the, um, um, you know, doing her school books and everything like that, and he makes a comedy and says, you know, uh, I haven't read anything. She made me feel so ashamed that I hadn't read anything since I came to Boston. Listen to this. Not even a newspaper, he said. Mm-hmm. Not even a newspaper. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, at the very least, you know, Malcolm was reading newspapers. 
Okay. Right, right, so he right, wasn't right. as illiterate and he wasn't as uh, backwards as, uh, you know, he tried to present himself to be. But he wants to show the power of the, the nation of Islam to reform the most vicious criminals. And, uh, and that was the, you know, that was the purpose of him even agreeing to the book. And he also admitted that, you know, for lack of a better term, he was snitching on his cohorts because that would not have reflected well in the narrative, uh, you know, in the character building process. What was that? I'm sorry, I, I missed that point there, brother. You know, that, you know, that he had cooperated with the police against his cohorts uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, Shorty and, and them. Uh, that was omitted from the, the autobiography as well. Well, there were a lot of things that, I mean, brother, there is, I could write a book and to tell you the truth, I'm, uh, I have notes for a book that you can literally go through almost every single page, at least every other page of the autobiography of Malcolm X. And, uh, you, you will find that where it does not square with, you know, the facts that we know from history. But you know, do people uh, want to know the facts or do they want to love the myth? Because a lot of people just want to love the myth. Well, you know, that was the problem when the book first came out. You know, my involvement with the book uh, is that I helped set up, you know, some of the interviews for the book. Um, you know, my own relationship to Malcolm is that, you know, obviously I did not know Malcolm myself, but the three closest brothers to Malcolm X uh, the, who are in the book, Brother Lukman Abdul Rahim, who was called Anis Lukman in Manning's book, uh, James 67 X Warden, also known as, as James Shabazz, also known as Abdul, Abdullah Abdul Razak, and Benjamin 2X Kareem. You know, I knew them very well. You know, I knew them very well, spent a lot of time with them, and, um, you, know, uh, you know, can talk about Malcolm like I knew him, you know, because. You know, I, I just downloaded those brothers and, you know, and I, you know, and they were very protective of his legacy. And let me just say that, you know, they were very protective of his legacy. And a lot of the material in Manning's book, you know, hadn't been known for years because those brothers and sisters were protecting uh, the, the mythology that and the legend that had uh, developed around Malcolm as a result of his assassination. And we have to mention two. Yeah. Mm -hmm that Betty Shabazz had his documents thrown out, right, from his home, from where she was staying, right? And Warth Dean Muhammad had the archives of the nation destroyed. So a lot of the history were, miss, were missing anyway, so the mythology becomes that much more uh, important. Yeah, well, the problem that Manning encountered when he was, he talked about the writing his book, which is that, you know, there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books um, theatrical productions, movies, films, poetry, uh, you know, um, creative output related to the life of Malcolm X. You know, very little of it is based on primary sources, okay? And that is the challenge of any historian, is to get the primary sources. And, uh, you know, so much about Malcolm's life actually was... Um, in the basement of his home, of the home of his wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz, all right, in New York, um, who, you know, for many, many years just would not allow scholars and researchers access to it. You know, his travel journal, all right, um, you know, his papers, his letters. The diary, yeah. The diary, you know. So it wasn't all destroyed. It wasn't all destroyed. And the proof of that is that, you know, uh, after her untimely and um, tragic death, um, you know, their youngest daughter, Malika, without the you know, knowledge of the other sisters, she took what was left, all right, of, of what Betty did not destroy, and she put it in a storage facility someplace in, someplace in Florida. And, um, you know, as time went on, she stopped paying the bill. And we're talking about Malcolm's Holy Quran, his travel journal, his letters, okay, his artifacts, tape recorder, you know, all these, all these, you know, these um, precious uh, artifacts and, uh, and uh, documents, and they were ultimately put on auction, okay? One of the auction houses, <laughs> we're going to auction off, uh, you know, these, uh, these treasures, and, you know, thank God, the, you know, the Malcolm community, the nationalists, 
Uh, Manning Marable had a big hand to play in this. You know, the Muslims that love Malcolm, you know, there was a hue and cry to get these documents and these artifacts, uh, you know, back uh, in the possession of the Shabazz family. And now they are deposited at the Schomburg Institute. And one of the, um, you know, I would say the uh, more salient dimensions of Manning's book is that that's the first book on Malcolm X that has access to his, you know, his travel diary and his journal when he was in Mecca and, and in Africa. So let's move on to the political Malcolm. Uh, the political Malcolm and the religious, the religious will be next, but the political Malcolm is one, uh, and you can tie this both to the political and the religious. When James 6, 7, X said, you know, by the time I get done defending Malcolm's position, he's already changed it. His, cha his positions were moving that rapidly. The great body of Malcolm lectures, the great body of, of what the public knows about Malcolm comes from his years uh, under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, where he very much had the uh, staunch uh, anti-desegregationist uh, political line, the anti-civil rights movement political line. Uh, and then we see an evolution in the politics of Malcolm, that by the time he dies, he's telling Coretta Scott King that he'll, you know, he's willing to work and wants to assist Dr. King. And, uh, we see a political evolution of Malcolm, the Pan-Africanists, etc. How would you briefly describe the political arc of Malcolm? Well, because uh, obviously, you know, uh, you know, Malcolm by, you know, by his very nature, you know, his character, he was an activist. All right, he was an activist, uh, you know, to the bone and to the marrow. You know, even in prison, before he was released. Uh, in fact, the FBI... Even as a opened, child, as a Garvey household, you could argue. Well, um, I, don't, I don't, you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a kid, you know, at, at, right. during those years. But, that, mean, it, you know, but, that influence, but that influence could have been deposited somewhere up there. Yeah, I mean, but I'm talking about... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, sure. I mean, you know, his father yeah. was a Garvey and he was the favorite of his father. His father took him to the meetings, you know, that he, that he held in the community. His father... <laughs> was um was something of a rabble rouser you know what i mean one of those uh one of those bad negroes you know one of the, uh, the folks who uh would make it difficult for the other black people in the community you know because talking all that black talk and what have you but he was a very you know committed garveyite and that resonated through the entire you know little family family you know uh you know it was the little family that converted malcolm to the nation of islam and his brother Wilfred said that uh, right, his it, brothers it, it, was, it was the closest yeah. thing that we, you know, that we could find that matched what Garvey had. So, you know, mm -hmm. we joined it. All right. So, it, you know, but uh, Malcolm was, at first was not receptive to it. Uh, you know, he was uh, very bitter towards religion. Uh, he was very cynical. Um, but, you know, he uh, comes around. All right. And um, he, he becomes a, a very staunch uh, adherent to the philosophy of Elijah Muhammad, and while he's in prison, we're talking about his activism, all right, he's writing letters to, to you know, to change the dietary laws for, uh, you know, Muslim uh, prisoners. He wants to be able to face East and whatever. This actually makes it into the newspaper, and uh, this is the first time the FBI opens up a file on Malcolm, all right? Now, so whether we're talking about, you know, years later, the whole scandal with the babies, Elijah Muhammad's illegitimate children, and, uh, you know, the ostensible reason why he left. The truth of the matter is, is that, you know, Malcolm was embarrassed. He was very deeply embarrassed by all of the gains that were being made by the civil rights movement. I mean, he talked about the, you know, the farce on Washington, which, he, which was actually, you know, the march on Washington, and, uh, you know, uh, the message to the grassroots. But in his heart, you know, in his heart, he could see that gains were being made. And um, he wanted to jump into the fray, so to speak. He wanted to fight on behalf of his people. And he was being hamstrung by the uh, anti-activist, pacifist, you could say, philosophy of the nation of Islam. And what right. really... What the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. what the autobiography doesn't really tell is that for years, tension had been building between Malcolm and other forces in the nation, especially out of Chicago, 
because Malcolm wanted to be politically engaged. He wanted to be a politically a political figure, and he knew that he could be a major figure on the American political scene, but was hamstrung by the confinements within the nation. Would that be a correct? Well, well, he, he already was a major player on the American scene. He was a major player on the American scene. Malcolm was the second most requested speaker on the college campus, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, circuit. All right. After Barry Goldwater. Barry, Barry Goldwater was number one. Malcolm was number two. And Who he endorsed in 64. And he endorsed him, which was an embarrassment, you know, because mm. uh, black folks were, you know, endorsing Johnson. Um, but the point is, so he was always, a, you know, mm -hmm. since, since the hate that he produced in 1959, uh, produced by, you know, Mike Wallace and Louis mm -hmm. Lomax, uh, he, that Malcolm, you know, was a national figure. He always was a national figure. But, um, you know, the, the charge against the nation of Islam, the so-called black Muslims, was that, you know, they talked that militant, they talked the militant game, okay? They talked militant talk, all right? But they wouldn't do anything unless it was uh, against another Muslim. You know, they didn't stand with their fellow African American brother and sister in the street. You know, they and they were. You know, they were the most disciplined, the most militant looking, most militant acting, most militant talking group. But they didn't really do too much, and this became a huge uh, contradiction that Malcolm, the activist, uh, over time could not. Uh, you know, he couldn't tolerate it. I believe whether there was a baby scandal or not, in time, he was going to have to leave the Nation of Islam because... And that um, was just a pretext, more or less. That was just... Well, I mean, you know... Because he had known about these babies for a while. I mean, it was, you know... Yeah, he, he had heard about the babies going back to, you know, the, you know, the, the mid-50s, you know, around mm -hmm. 55 or what have you. He had heard about these... But the, you know... It's the kind of thing where, you know, if you think your, you know, your wife is cheating on you, you know, some things you really don't want to find out. You would rather you know, not know. Because the ramifications right. of finding out, yeah, you'd rather right. not know. So, right, right, you know, right, right, and right. so, uh, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and to his credit, you know, to Malcolm's credit, when he left the Nation of Islam, um, he tried to... Um, he tried to be conciliatory, you know. He said, "Look, I'm still a follower of Mr. Muhammad. I believe his solution is the correct solution." Or he didn't just go out, you know, throwing the baby thing out. All right, that didn't come out actually until he came back from Mecca. All right, he was forming the, uh, you know, OAAU. Okay, um, you know, that's when it came up. When he was losing the house, when it was clear he was going to be evicted from the house, and when it was also clear, you know, that they that they were trying to kill him. All right. When, See, I'm, you know, I'm still so with the lies, mom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was, you know, or at least he, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, trying to disparage the man and tear the man down. I mean, he went to court I mean? and argued that he was still a follower of Elijah Muhammad, if memory serves me correct. Well, no. When he, you know, when he, that was a, that was that was a doom strategy that okay. Malcolm was trying to employ uh, when he, you know, when he when he went to court in June of uh, 1964, uh, that was, uh, you know, that was just a really pathetic attempt on uh, Malcolm's part to, you know, stay in the house, to claim that he was still a follower, you know, it was, was a joke, and that, that trial was a catastrophe, you know, and one of the, and that's when he comes out of the trial and he says, well, you know, they're afraid that I'm going to tell the real reason why I left the nation, which I've never told, you know, and, uh, you know, at that point, um, you know, first of all, he had already put the baby thing out there, you know, in a speech at the Autobahn. But second of all, um, that was a point of no return. Okay, up to that point, one could have argued that, you know, Malcolm could have walked away with his life. You know what I mean? If he had just, mm -hmm. as the young people say, you know, taken the L <laughs> and just <laughs> kind of calmed down or maybe taken, you know, himself and his family to Africa, you know, uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser offered them a position in the government, Kwame Nkrumah offered them a position in the government, Ahmed Ben Bella offered them a, a, a position in their government, you know, and Algeria. Manning has a quote, yeah, Algeria. And, and, um, and, and, and the expat community in Ghana wanted him to go there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, 
you know, Jamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt uh, and Ahmed bin Bella in Algeria. They all offered him a position in the government. Now, you know, one of the things that Manning quotes in uh, uh, Malcolm's travel diary, which is very interesting, Malcolm was quoted as saying when he's in Ghana, you know, with the expat community, with Maya Angelou and Julian Mayfield and uh, Alice Wyndham and, and, and others in that community, is he says, there's a quote in Manning's book, very interesting. Um, it would be better for me personally, you know, to stay in Africa, but it would be bad for me politically, you know. And people were begging Malcolm. Alex Haley was pleading with him, think about your wife, think about your children, okay. Think about, think about them and what this is causing them, you know. Uh, I know for a fact, uh, Ozzie Davis and Ruby D, they were, uh, they were pleading with me, you know, don't, you know, just, just, you know, calm down, calm this down. One of the more people, humorous you know? parts of the book is Ruby D wanted to, uh, have a secret compartment in the house where Malcolm would sleep at, and they say Ozzie Davis, uh, vetoed that idea. Yeah, they were, uh, you know, that's where he was. That's where he was moving. I mean, you know, a lot of folks don't know that uh, uh, Ruby D's brother, Tom Wallace, was a very loyal follower of Malcolm X. In fact, uh, when the house was firebombed on February 14th, 1965, it's Tom Wallace who took in Malcolm's wife and uh, four daughters, uh, his pregnant wife, I should say, because she was pregnant with the twins at the time. It was, uh, it was um, Ruby Dee's brother, Tom Wallace, who, Let's talk about where they the were o staying when he was assassinated. Let's talk about the OOAU, Organization of Afro-American Unity, which was really, you know, if you talk to Muslims, the focus was religious at the end of his life, but really the focus at the end of his life was building the OOAU. Tell me about that organization. Well, you know, it was modeled on the Organization of African Unity, okay, which Malcolm attended you know, this session, and he was trying to put America on trial before the world for yeah, the yeah. Uh, you know, oppression of African Americans and the violation of their human rights. Okay? Uh, he wanted it to be something like of, uh, uh, of an, you know, an umbrella organization that could you know, unite all of the, you know, the black organizations, black movements, black occurrence of black struggle, black freedom movement in America. Um, but to tell you the truth, I mean, you know, um, it, it really wasn't worked out, you know, in, in the greatest of detail. He didn't really have time to really formulate, uh, you know, what it was, you know, really going to be about. Uh, you know, at, at times he was talking about voting rights. You know, if you don't vote, you're a traitor to your race, you know, uh, you know, he, he was talking about Pan-Africanism. You know, sometimes, you know, he talked about socialism. Um, and know, the followers were having a, a hard time figuring out where he was at politically because it was changing so rapidly. Well, um, when you say the followers, you're probably you know, talking it, about it, it, the, yeah. You, you, yeah. Well, there was a lot of confusion because what happened was when Malcolm went overseas, um, he, he created, a, you know, it was a top-down type of leadership, all right? The only leadership model that he knew was the type that he saw with Elijah Muhammad. You know, you have the strong man at the top who issues edicts and the people hear and obey, okay? So when you have that type of strong man type of leadership structure, all right, and he didn't really leave anyone in charge with any type of authority, you know, and there was no clear lines of demarcation and, and you know, uh, um, responsibilities and who was supposed to do what and so uh when he left for africa for all those months it just created this vacuum you know and so it created a, a lot of uh tension and friction between the oa the oaau and the musa mosque incorporated there was a, a lot of mutual recrimination a lot of bitterness a lot of uh, you know uh ill feelings between the two groups I mean, so much so, like, uh, about 40 years later, you know, we tried to organize a, um, like, a, um, a, you know, a commemoration for Brother Malcolm and, uh, you know, his life, remember his life and legacy. And, like, 40 years later, man, those, those folks could not 
get in the same room with one another. OAU folks didn't want to get in the same room with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated folks and vice versa. You know, it's really sad. In brief, where do you think Malcolm would be politically if he'd lived going into the 70s and 80s and 90s and turn of the century? Man, you know, I, I've gone over that so many times uh, trying to figure that out. It's so real, it's so difficult to tell. Um, you know, think about it. He wasn't even out of the nation of Islam an entire year. You know, it was 11 months and some weeks. So, um, you know, it's hard, it, it's really hard to say. I, I don't I don't know you know, where the brother was going. I, I don't, I, he definitely was not going in my judgment. And this is the reason why, you know, Manning's book was criticized so virulently. He, he was not going the way of black power, you know, uh, picking up the gun and killing police and this and that. He, he wasn't going that way. He wanted to be, it's very clear to me that Malcolm wanted to be a mainstream leader, okay? He wanted to be like Dr. King, he genuinely loved. Um, Would you say more benefits? Let, let me finish Carl this Martin. point. Let me finish. Let me yeah. finish this point. He right. genuinely enjoyed being, you know, considered a a, a first-rate black intellectual, mm -hmm. uh, a debater. He loved being on the college campuses. Okay, and um, you know, he he wanted to be a player on the American scene. I mean, if Malcolm wanted to in his lifetime. He could have started riots. Okay, it is, in his lifetime, he could have called for people to take up arms against the police. Malcolm never advocated that. All right, you know, kill the pig and this, that, this, that, and what have you. You know, that was never his philosophy. And even the rifle clubs that he uh, suggested, uh, he, you know, he started phasing that out of his speeches because it wasn't getting him where you know where he wanted to go, which was in the mainstream. This is why you know he's. You know, he started uh, really uh, enjoying the support of people like Isaac Davis, Ruby D, uh, Juanita Portier, you know, uh, the Peter Baileys, the Lynn Shiflets, the, you know, the intellectuals and the writers. Okay, this is where he was going, you know. He, he was not, you know, very super religious as, uh, you know, as he's portrayed, you know. Okay, we're going to move to religion next. But just before this, one brief question. Do you think he would have been on a spectrum uh, more militant than the Stoke to Carl Michael or less closer to the mainstream? I think he would have been left. Less. Yeah. Okay. I, I okay, think now let's move on. would have been left. All right, let's move, move, move By on. By the way, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to get in a lot of trouble for saying that. But you know, <laughs> I, know, I know what I'm saying. And I can, hey, man. You know, and neither I one of us are strangers saying. to trouble. So yeah. uh, 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 move on to the, the Muslim now. Now, both of us coming from Sunni Orthodox Muslim background. Correct. And in the Muslim community, the narrative of Malcolm is different than in the, in the greater and the wider community. The Muslim narrative is is that his life was defined by his journey to Hajj, and after the Hajj, he was all about Sunni orthodoxy and coming back to build a Sunni Islamic movement in America, and that those that left him to start the Muslim Mosque Incorporated did so with the intention to start the Sunni movement. That's not supported by the facts. Um, uh, how would you describe Malcolm's religious journey in the last year of his life? Well, you know, I think that he formed the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. I'm starting to think that it was an ad hoc thing. You know, I mean, when he, he broke from the nation so abruptly, you know, on March 8th, 1964, um, I, you know, it wasn't thought out very well at all. You know, Malcolm wanted to be a leader for all of black America, all right? And he understood, or he started to figure out real soon that the uh, framework of a Muslim organization was not going to meet those ends, all right? When he left the nation, uh, the brothers and sisters who left with him, all right, they they didn't really know what was going on. You know what I mean? They loved Malcolm. They wanted to support him. They didn't really uh, understand everything that was going on. This is what people have to you know, realize, is that the, you know, the rank-and-file brothers and sisters were not privy to all of this you know, palace intrigue and machinations that was um, going on in Chicago. They just knew that you know, Brother Malcolm left some people believe, um, some that left with him and some that remained, you know, with Elijah Muhammad 
which was the vast majority, uh, that this was just maybe a, a new strategy that Malcolm and the messenger, uh, you know, are carving out to get more followers. You know, right. they, they, you know. So the point is that, you know, no, they left the nation of Islam as black Muslims. You know, if you, if you want to call it such a thing, um, you know, they were followers not to become of the black so, Not to become so. Oh, definitely not. No, they believed the white man was the devil. Okay, and in fact, to tell you the truth, funny story. Uh, when Malcolm came back from Hajj, all right, some of the brothers who were following him asked him, did he see Master Farad Muhammad in Mecca, you hmm. know, when he, when, when, he, when he went over there to, uh, you know, to make the pilgrimage? Right. You know, did right. they see the founder, W.D. Farad? Did you, see, did you see Master Farad Muhammad over there, you know? And Malcolm said something to the effect of, um, you know, brother, we have to, you have to be more realistic, brother, you know. <laughs> you know, see, going back, I'll never forget I was a young Muslim. And I met an old head from the nation who knew Malcolm. And he really stomped on my dreams. And I just had to put it out of my mind. Uh, he said, brother, he said, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had already been to Hajj. Well, he'd been to Umrah, but he described it as a Hajj. He said, Malcolm had already been overseas and seen light skin. He saw so the whole tale of this racial transformation in Hodge, the brother had a hard time accepting. And he also said, well, Wallace and other sons of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which is, I guess he's talking about uh, Akbar, and now we found out Malcolm's sister, were already into Sunni Orthodox Islam. So Malcolm had known about Sunni Orthodox Islam for years. Oh, of course, well, let me explain something to you, brother. Yeah. Let me share something with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Forget the nation of Islam. You know, long before he uh, joined the nation of Islam, all right, there was a Ahmadiyya Muslim by the name of Abdul Hamid who visited him and Shorty in the uh, Norfolk prison colony, all right, who taught them, you know, how to make salah, taught them the basics of, you know, the Islamic creed. Uh, you know, when Malcolm, um, you know, was educating himself, he was able to avail himself of the library of uh, Lewis Parkhurst, who was a uh, Massachusetts state senator who, before politics, was actually a book publisher, okay? And he had a vast and expansive library that he willed to the Norfolk prison colony uh, in 1949 when he died, when Malcolm was there. And Malcolm, and it was heavy on religion, you know, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, uh, you know, it, uh, all the religions, okay, the Eastern religions. And uh, Malcolm consumed that library, okay. So even before the Nation of Islam, he, you know, he knew what is Orthodox Islam was, okay. But he chose to follow the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He chose to follow that creed and that ideology. Not only that, brother, but Louis Lomax, who brought Malcolm and the Nation of Islam to the attention of uh, Mike Wallace in 1959 that, that went on to become, you know, the hate that hate produced, where the Nation of Islam electrified the country uh, at this black hate group, all right, this, this uh, you know, this militant, um, dangerous group of black haters, you know, um, Louis Lomax loved Malcolm, and he followed his career very closely, debated Malcolm on different occasions, all right? And he, you know, he would uh, 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 occasion Malcolm's uh, um, speeches on the college campuses. And when Malcolm would be walking to his car, the Muslims from Algeria, Muslims from Syria, you know, Muslims from, you know, Bosnia, okay? And this is going back Turkish years. Muslims, quote, unquote, oh, listen, Going back, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, oh, his, his 12 years in the Nation of Islam. They were, they were, okay, they were, they we're were a little bit of problem with that. Say, look, we're Muslims and yeah. we're not black. We're not Muslim. So, you know, he, then he had Sheikh Dawood al Faisal, okay, uh, who founded uh, the right. State Street Mosque, who was criticizing him in the public. He had, uh, you know, the, uh, the brother, uh, the West Indian brother, uh, Talib Dawood, all right, and D Dakota Stanton, his wife, you know, they were criticizing the nation. So, you know, look, <clears throat> this thing that... He
He went overseas, he went to Hajj, and then, you know, he saw the light, he saw a white Muslim. He saw white Muslims in 1959 when he went over there to uh, prepare the way for Elijah Muhammad's Umrah, all right? Uh, now, I'm not saying it was completely cynical. Uh, I'm not saying that he didn't experience a you know, spiritual, uh, um, you know, revelation, if I can use that word, you know, when he went on his Hajj. But, you know, this thing about, uh, you know, he, he ate with men whose eyes were the blue, it's the blue and the whitest of white. And, uh, and this was a different type of white man that he met. Uh, this was, in some sense, a, a way to uh, reinvent himself. Okay, you know, talk about a life of reinvention. Malcolm, right. in order to go mainstream, listen to me, hold this point here. In order for him to go mainstream, he knew he had to rid himself of this white devil dogma. All right. He had to get rid of that. So he writes this, this letter from Mecca and he hand copies it. All right. And he sends it to everyone. He sends it to Mike Handler, S.M. Handler, the New York Times. He sends it to C. You know, C. You know, uh, um, uh, C. L. Lincoln. Uh, I think it's. I'm, I'm getting this. It's getting late here. I got a bus here. I'm trying to think. We have a brain brain freeze here. Uh, but uh, he sends it to Lincoln, the scholar. Okay. He sends it to all these different people. All right, see Eric, see Eric Lincoln even, I believe, got two letters, got two of the same letter, all right? Because when he came back to the United States, he didn't want to have to be dealing with the baggage and the albatross of Elijah Muhammad's doctrine around his neck. He knew he would never be able to, you know, move into that mainstream unless he could get this off his, you know, off his, uh, off his ledger. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that was a, a kind of a, a public relations uh strategy on his on his part and you know for the most part it worked all right for the sake of time we got to move on to the next but let me just add this uh uh with regards to malcolm and the race and the hides i was just viewing the race of a racial discussion and uh non-black muslims were saying you cannot talk about race didn't we learn the lesson of malcolm x you shouldn't talk about race race means nothing so talk about no. reinventing <laughs> yeah, that was uh, uh, not getting the message. Um, let's move on to the death, the tragic death, the assassination, the Audubon Ballroom, the tension with Chicago is building up with Newark, with other forces, and it culminates in the assassination in the Audubon Ballroom. To me, one of the great tragedies is this is there are so many loose ends, there are so many conspiracies, there are so many things that don't make sense in terms of security and this and that that we may never know the 100% truth of what happened that night. Is that something you wrestle with yourself? Um, you know, I've tried. I've spent a couple of decades trying to get to the bottom of this thing. Uh, you know, at, right now as we speak, there's tens of thousands of documents uh, in the federal government and in the New York City Police Department, the boss files, Bureau of Special Services, uh, that have yet to be released, you know, that may answer uh, some of those questions. Um, let me just say this, though. We can determine from the energy that Elijah Muhammad was putting out, okay, and from the energy, the, the negative and hostile energy that he uh, allowed his ministers to project uh, to the community that, um, you know, the nation of Islam could have very easily carried this out without any, uh, you know, government uh, say so or, or initiative. You know, once the, you know, once the uh, once once the, the, the wheels were set in motion, you know, it, it was just easy to let the, the, the two sides go at one another and do uh, exactly what happened. You know, right. But the aftermath is so much strange as people falling off and people dying and this and that. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I don't think we know the full story of what happened that day. That, well, know. we know a lot of it. I mean, we, we know, know a lot, a lot of, it. of it. Yeah, we know we know a lot of it, at least in terms of uh, who pulled the trigger, uh, how it was planned, um, how it was carried out. Uh, we we do know a lot about that, you know. And you've talked know. to some of them, right? You've talked to, you've been in contact. Yes, with them, I have. Right? Yes, I have. I've yeah. I've spoken to. Um, I've just spoken to uh, Talmadge Hare. 
uh, who's, by the way, very repentant for what he's done. You know, I mean, he's just living his life. Uh, he's an exemplary Muslim. I mean, you know, his, his wife is the pillar of the Muslim community up there in, in, in Brooklyn. And, um, you know, he's very, very regretful for what he did. I and mean, he's only 22 years old. And, uh, you know, here's what you have to understand, brother, is that these assassins were themselves lied to. OK, they were gassed up. They were pumped up by these ministers. When Malcolm um, was silenced, all right, in uh, December of uh, 1963, okay, mm -hmm. when he was silenced, a propaganda campaign was waged against him from Chicago, and it was filtered down through the ministers. John right? Ali, Raymond Sharif. John no, Ali, no. Raymond Sharif, Herbert Muhammad, at all, mm -hmm. okay? And it went like this. Brother... If you knew what Malcolm was saying about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you would kill him yourself, you know. Mm. Or it would, it would come out like this. They would, they would employ colorism, you know. And if you knew what Red was saying, man, you'd kill him yourself, you know. That's how it was done. And, and, so and they, their they, concern was his taking, being the next leader, taking him out of the money position. They had a financial concern in taking out Malcolm. Would you say that's correct? Well, they, you know, they had a lot of reasons for wanting to take Malcolm out. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, Malcolm was, uh, he was an honest person. Um, you know, I mean, if you think about it, Malcolm was what you call a true believer. He believed 100%. I mean, so much so, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, he was the most requested speaker on the college campuses, right? After Barry Goldwater. Do you know that all of those honorariums he gave to the Nation of Islam, you know, which created some serious problems in his marriage, some very serious problems, okay? He gave away... Which was know, a rocky marriage, of, anyway. Tens of thousands of dollars in honorariums, and he just gave it to the nation, all right? So he was a true believer. Now, the, the family of Muhammad, the Herbert Muhammad, the Nathaniel Muhammad, the Emmanuel, the Lotties, the Ethels, okay? Uh, I don't say Wallace, and I don't say Akbar, you know? But most of the other ones, uh, you know, in, in my judgment, uh, you know, they... They weren't, they weren't worth very much, to tell you the truth. You know what I'm saying? And they feared Malcolm because uh, Malcolm had his own crew. All right? He had what it used to be the this, this statement that Malcolm had his own ministers or Malcolm's ministers. You know, Minister Farrakhan, Isaiah Kareem, Lonnie X. Cross in Washington, you know, uh, Captain Joseph, who wasn't a minister, but who was, you know, the FOI boss. You know, his two brothers, Wilford in Detroit. Filbert in uh, Lansing, all right, and and you know, half of more than half of the masjids or mosques in the Nation of Islam were founded by Malcolm or his understudies, or his students. So the fear was that you know, when when the old man died, when Daddy dies, you know, Malcolm's going to come to power, and we're going to lose this, uh, we're going to lose this uh, this gravy train that we've got here. One of Elijah Muhammad's daughters, I believe it was Ethel was recorded to have said, you know, man, we better make all the money we can before daddy's followers wake up, before these fools following daddy wake up, you know. And so of course, Muhammad, 75, yeah. So, Muhammad, you know, so, so yes, Malcolm was, you know, a threat to uh, the empire that was built, you know, by, uh, really, really built by him, really, tell you the truth. And of course, in 75, Worth of Dean takes over after the death of Elijah, and he breaks it up anyway. Uh, and then, and then a couple of years later, uh, Louis Farrakhan tries to reconstruct uh, uh, the nation. Well, yeah, brother. So look, I, I like I like to like uh, you know wind it down and uh, just to say that um, you know a lot of these issues that we're discussing, we're going to go into great detail when we on the tour uh, take our tour on May is May nineteenth, brother Malcolm's birthday. I know it's during Ramadan, so Muslims are going to be you know, fasting. You can break your fast when you're traveling, but we want you to come. We're going to visit, like I said, we're going to visit uh, his, um, his masjid. We're going to visit the site of the assassination. We're going to, and, you know, what, what, really I, pay homage to him at the grave site, uh, which is, by the way, a lot of celebrities are buried in that grave site. A lot of people how do you know, get Leah, tickets? Leah's buried there, and... Uh, you just go to, um, you know, it's on Facebook. It's on my Facebook page. Just go to um, Malcolm X Historical Excursion on Coach Bus. 
All right. It's on Facebook. Uh, it's like I say, it's on it's on uh, Eventbrite, and it's on my uh, face Facebook page, and uh, it's easy to find. Charter bus leaving from Washington D.C. Malcolm X historical incursion tour, led by Malcolm X expert research historian Abdul Rahman Muhammad. I really wish I could be in D.C. in May. We all know, so no, no, that, that, Bob. We got we got Bob Zach Kondo too, who wrote the definitive book on the assassination conspiracies unraveling the assassination of Malcolm X. I'm going to post some of his videos on the page, uh, the Facebook page. This brother's a bad man. He is a bad dude, man. I mean, well, we're going to talk about on that. the East Coast, be it that we're talk... What's that, brother? I'm sorry. I said, if you're anywhere on the East Coast, be on that tour. Anywhere on oh, you the don't East Coast. Miss... You don't want to miss it. We've made it very, you know, we've made it very affordable for anyone. To anyone who wants to go, they can go, and I would book the tickets early because, uh, you know, the seating is very limited, and it's a very historic occasion. Well, there you have it. Uh, Abdurrahman Muhammad, thanks for joining me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I apologize to viewers for the technical difficulties earlier, but I think we had a wonderful interview on the life of El-Hajj Malika Shabazz Malcolm X. Peace. Thank you. Peace, brother.